We are in week three of our Function of Fasting series. And I am so grateful for Pastor Keenan, who has taken the time to give us a whole month to wrap our minds, wrap our hearts around the function of fasting. Fasting is one of those things that it's so easy to um, get the, the general idea and then say, I'm going to jump right into this because I want a response from God or I, I'm in need of something, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into this. And I'm so thankful that Pastor Keenan has taken the time to really walk us through what it means because when you do that, when you, when you fast and you don't have the right posture, you don't have the full revelation of what you're doing, it's just glorified dieting. There's no spiritual impact on what you are doing. Hosea 4 and 6 declares that my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. And I came across that scripture, and it's one of those scriptures you hear all the time. My people perish because of the lack of knowledge. My people perish. But that second part about because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. And it took me back to our casual Christianity series where we talked about being kings and priests. We talked about being temples of the Holy Spirit. And this scripture is quoted so often about being destroyed because of our lack of, of knowledge. But this piece of being rejected as priests, if we are called to be kings and priests, if we are called to teach, if we are called to draw God's people, how do we do that if we don't have understanding? How are we to do that if we don't know why we believe what we believe? We're offering the world a counterfeit if we can't express and communicate a reason for our hope. And so when we go into biblical practices like fasting, if, again, we're just doing it based off some worldly understanding of something, we're not going to see the results. And our natural response as people, if we don't see results, what happens? Our faith is weakened. And we start saying this thing doesn't really work. And, and maybe this Christian thing, it, it's, it's not really all that they say it is to be because I'm not seeing the results. And so teaching, preaching of the word of God and truly understanding why we do what we do is essential to the integrity of our faith. How can we be priests if we don't know what the word of God says? And, and I know when you hear the word priest, you may think, Pastor Z, well, that's for you and Pastor Keenan and, and maybe some super saved folks that go to the church. That's not for the average believer. But that is a lie from the pit of hell. We are all called to walk in the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. It is not limited to someone with a microphone. It's not limited to someone who, who spends a bunch of time at church. It's not limited to the folks who grew up in church. If I confess Jesus Christ as Lord, I am an ambassador of heaven. And I am called to walk in the fullness of what that means on this side of heaven. And so we, before we jump into the meat of the teaching tonight, um, I, I felt it was really important to kind of level set and to get some clarity on just our posture in terms of how we engage with the word of God. We live in a time where we declare that we believe in the promises of God. No matter where you find them, Old Testament, New Testament, we're going to stand on the promises of God. We love to quote Psalm 91 when, when there is trial and there is um, turmoil in the land. That's Old Testament. And often we'll, we'll take the blessings of God no matter where they come from in the word. But then when we start talking about curses, 
when we start talking about covenant, when we start talking about obedience, it's like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's Old Testament stuff. That, that was only about, like, Bible times. That's not relevant to today. And so I'm not here to debate you on what context you're pulling scriptures from, but what I am here to highlight is every time that you compromise the word of God, every time you compromise the integrity of the faith, you are only hurting yourself. As I said, I'm not here to debate you on context and what applies to today and what applies during biblical times. What I desire is to highlight that when we pick apart the word of God and what is true and what is not true, we are weakening our faith stance. You see, every time we allow our opinion to dictate how true something is, when we need God, it's hard to stand on his word because we've compromised it. So I need to make a a decision. I, I have this big thing that I'm facing that I'm up against. And when I go to God and I say, okay, well, I didn't believe your word about my sin and that mattering, Do you know how hard it is to believe God for freedom and breakthrough when you know that you didn't stand on the truth of it back here? It's it's a scheme of the enemy. You think that, oh, I'm I'm just being open-minded. I don't want to sound religious. I don't want to be a Bible thumper. And so you compromise and you say, well, that must not be true. But then when you're in the doctor's office and you get a report, And you want everything in this Bible to be true. You know what the enemy comes in and does and says, well, remember you said it it, was that part of scripture didn't matter. So so who says that this promise of healing through the blood of Jesus is real? It's a trap of the enemy that weakens our stance. And so you can debate all you want about the relevancy, about context about what's applicable, but what I need you to recognize, what I need us to understand is it's bait from the enemy to compromise the integrity of your faith. And when you need to stand on the promises of God, when you need to stand flat-footed and not fold because all hell is breaking loose, it's a whole lot harder to do that when you've been compromising the word of God. We have to do the work to understand that God's word is the ultimate authority. And God is okay when it doesn't sit right with you. When it's hard to receive a truth in the word of God, it's not our, it's not our responsibility to prove it. It's our, resp- our responsibility to humble ourselves before God and say, I don't understand. This is hard for me. Holy Spirit, I invite you in to give me clarity, to give me understanding and awareness of the truth of your word. Many of God's promises that we love to quote are contingent upon our participation. And we quote them as if they are matter of fact, no matter what no matter how we live, no matter how we posture ourselves, no matter what we open ourselves up to. And then we say, it didn't happen. It didn't manifest. The door wasn't open. The relationship wasn't restored. There are contingencies to the promises of God. And so that, I I need us to understand that because I may say some things tonight and you may say, "I I don't really know if that applies. And when the enemy comes in with that thought, I need you to remember his goal is to weaken the authority of the word of God. And when the authority of the word of God is weakened, your faith stance is weakened. And you don't have the power to take authority over what we have been given access to through Christ Jesus. I'm not going to go through the the past two weeks, but I highly recommend you go back and watch the replays of uh, week one and two of the function of fasting. What I will remind us of is what fasting is not before we jump into the text. 
Fasting is not a way to change God's mind. Fasting is not a way to get what you want from God. Fasting is not consecration. What is the difference, Pastor Z? You'll hear people say, fast from social media. Fast from TV. Fast from these things. Those are call- that's called consecration. Biblical fasting is refraining from food. Crucifying this flesh. Fasting is not just refraining from food. It's replacing our food with the bread of life. Time with Jesus. Worshiping in our word. If you're just refraining from food, it's glorified dieting. You must replace time, intimacy with God in order to be walking out a true fast. So our key verse for this series is Matthew, from, coming from Matthew 17, and it says, When they approached the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, kneeling before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and suffers terribly, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they were not able to heal him. And Jesus answered, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, Why could we not drive out? Why could we not drive it out? He answered, Because of your little faith your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God. For I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have living faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move here to there. And if it is God's will, it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21. But this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There are two things that I want to deal with today in that chunk of text. The first one is lack of faith. The scripture said that they couldn't cast out the demon that was oppressing the man's son because they lacked faith. These were Jesus' disciples who walked with him. How many of us say, well, maybe I would be more inclined to believe in Jesus if I was back in biblical times, if I actually got to see him and touch him and, and see the miracles. The disciples are no different than we are today. And they struggled with unbelief. Unbelief doesn't just show up in our thoughts or our opinions. Unbelief shows up in how we live. Unbelief shows up in how we demonstrate. You may say, Pastor Z, I believe in Jesus fully. I believe that he's the son of the living God. I believe that there's only one way to God, the Father, and that's through the son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died and he rose again. I believe in the blood of Jesus. And you may say that with your mouth, with the confession of your mouth. But why doesn't your lifestyle testify to that belief system? We can say many things with our mouths. But what does my life testify to? And for many believers who confess Jesus with their mouths, without that confession and just an observation of your life, We live like atheists. Without the confession through our vocal cords. Without the popping in to to a church service Sunday to Sunday. Without saying, this is my church home. No one would know that you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. 
And unbelief is one of those words that you can just easily kind of skim through. It's like, I, I don't believe, unbelief. But when we dig into the text, we see unbelief in the Bible. Um, when we look at the, the root translations, it actually, uh, it actually manifests or shows up in three different ways. This one word, the expression can speak to three different manifestations of un unbelief. The first one is unfaithfulness. I'm not faithful to the God that I claim to believe in. This unbelief is a type of betrayal. It speaks to our actions. We are like adulterous spouses. I'm married, but I'm still open. So I claim Jesus, but I'm open to other spiritual practices that the word of God forbids me to participate in. I'm in an open marriage with God. The Bible says our God is a jealous God. And you know what I find fascinating is most other spiritual practices, they have no problem with you worshiping as many gods as you want. They have no problem with mixture. They don't require exclusivity. And in the natural, most human beings all desire that. We desire exclusivity. We desire honesty. We desire purity in our relationship. But then when we come to God, we say, God, you, you should be open. And you should be open because this is trending right now. You should be open because this is what culture says is normal. You shouldn't have a problem with me going here or going there because th this is just this, the times that we're in. God, you just need to understand. But when your spouse comes home and says, I need you to just understand, I'm open to a few other things, you draw the line in the sand and say, absolutely not. And you're fed up. In no way will I tolerate this. But we expect God, the sovereign one, the holy one, who sent his son to die for our sins, to be open. To accept our worship of idols. To accept our worship of careers and titles and influence. He needs to be open. And then we wonder why we don't have the kind of relationships and friendships that testify to our God. We're an unfaithful people. And that's unbelief. The second way that unbelief manifests or shows up is our lack of desire for faith. This type of unbelief speaks to desire. I lack the desire. I'm withholding belief in the divine power. I, I refuse to believe the Bible is true. I refuse to believe in the divine mission of Jesus. I reject, I am in opposition to the gospel, and I do not believe. And this is what most of us think our unbelief is manifesting as. I reject the gospel. I don't believe it. And that, that's not the case. Most of us say, I don't reject the gospel. But what about that first expression? The third is unbelief speaks to weakness. The text said little faith. The lack of faith. This is the point that I opened up about, our stance on the word of God. That when we pick apart the word of God, we're not, we're not actually um, like making the truth any less true. We're not actually taking the credibility just because we won't come on board with it. We're not actually doing that. 
all we're doing is weakening our ability to stand in faith. We, whatever we eat, whatever we feed, that's what grows. When we feed our spirit man, our spirit man gets stronger. We feed our spirit man the word of God. If I compromise the word of God, my spirit man will not be strong. We cannot chop up the word of God and expect to live as living testimonies. We cannot chop up the word of God and expect to have power and authority that sets other people free. We will be like the disciples that we see in the text saying, Jesus, why couldn't I? Why couldn't I drive it out? Well, you've picked apart the word of God for the past 10 years. You said it's not relevant. Unless you need it to be. And now you want to operate in power and authority. And now you want the blessings of God to be yes and amen. It it never changed the validity of the word. It just changed your ability to stand in faith. Everything that I described can be wrapped up in the word unbelief. So I ask you to spend some time with God, because I know for me, I've read that scripture many times. I I don't have unbelief. I believe God. I believe you're true. And, And you can do that. You can say, I'm good. Or you can humble yourself and say, God, help my unbelief. Where is the unbelief? Where does my lifestyle testify to unbelief? Am I unfaithful? Am I disobedient? Am I rejecting the word? Am I rejecting who Jesus is? Or am I weak? Have I compromised so much that I'm weak and I have nothing to stand on? I beg you to spend some time in the presence of God and ask him to reveal the unbelief. If you can, turn with me to Mark 9, and I'm going to read this text. It says, Mark 9, I'm sorry, it's Mark 9, 14. That's where we're going to start. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him in the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that the man said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. 
we are talking about the function of fasting. The man said, I believe, help my unbelief. We need to be a people that recognizes that we all have unbelief. And we need God to help us. On this side of heaven, there is no man or woman walking the face of this earth that does not need help. We know in part on this side of heaven. We prophesy in part on this side of heaven. So our posture, we should never take the bait of Satan that says, I got this. When you feel like you got it, that's when you know it's time to humble yourself. That's when it's time to fast. There is no good, there is no benefit to acting holier than thou, that you have reached some supreme height, that you are no longer in need of help for your unbelief. Humble ourselves before God. And take the seriousness of the posture that we have and, and be diligent in recognizing the areas that we lack faith. I said there were two things I wanted to highlight from the text today. That was the first one, lack of faith. The second thing I want to pull out is the word kind. It says these kind only come out by fasting or praying. I'm going to read this, this scripture again. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, why could we not drive it out? He answered, because of your little faith, your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God. For I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And if it's God's will, it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. The first week of this sermon series and I had no idea what Pastor Keenan was, what we were going into. I didn't know the, the reference scriptures or anything. And before we were leaving uh, for service, um, I felt the Lord say, bring your Bible. A lot of times I just bring my journal um, and take notes. But I felt the Lord say, bring a Bible. And if you know me, I have way too many Bibles. Uh, and so I go to my shelf and I'm like, which Bible? And the Lord led me to bring this Bible. This Bible specifically. So I, all right, grabbed it, ran out the house. We get here, sermon starts, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I brought my, I brought my Bible when Pastor Keenan read this scripture. And so I opened it up. And many translations have omitted, but this kind of demon only go out by prayer and fasting. And they have all their theological reasons of why. I believe it's nothing but the enemy, but that's another sermon for another day. But it's omitted from many translations. It just stops at nothing will be impossible for you. And so in this Bible, I wrote in the last part. But this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And we open up. I open up my Bible, sitting, listening to the word. And next to kind, I had wrote kind equals bloodline. And so I knew immediately that if Pastor Keenan asked me to speak on this series, that that's what God wanted me to see. And so, like I said, some translations, they don't have it. They, you won't see that. And so take notice of that when you are studying. As I begin to prepare for tonight, I was like, I know I heard that somewhere. I know that there's more to it that I thought I was going to have the ability to remember. Uh, and I don't. So I started digging. I started studying. And like I said, I wrote kind equals bloodline. So the Greek translation for kind is the word genus, which means kindred, offspring, Family, stock, tribe, nation, nationality, or descent from a particular people. 
And the root word for Guinness is genomai. I think I pronounced it right. And that word means to become, to come into existence, to begin, to receive, to come to pass, to appear in history, to be made, to be performed. So we're not talking about any kind of demon. We're not talking about any kind of oppression. We're talking about the ones that are rooted before we ever walked on the face of this earth. We're talking about oppression from the pit of hell that is attached to bloodlines. And if you say, Pastor Z, but that's Old Testament thinking, I need to remind you that your belief in salvation is based on bloodline. Your access, if you are sitting in this room today and you believe that the acceptance of Jesus Christ secures your seat in heaven, then you believe in bloodline. So again, we don't get to pick apart the word of God and say what's relevant or what applies to me today and what doesn't apply to me. The root word of family, tribe, nation, offspring, before I came into existence. That there are things that have the ability to oppress me in my lived experience based off of decisions I never made. And again, you may say, I don't believe in all the cursed stuff. Well, then you don't get to believe in the blessing of Jesus. Because you're walking in freedom based off of something you did not do. Did you live a perfect, sinless life? Did you hang on a cross? Did you conquer death, hell, and the grave? Yet you take part in the grace of God. So we don't get to omit the relevance of what the word of God is telling us. That there are demons, that there are satanic forces that are doing everything in their power to oppress you from walking in the freedom that Jesus died for. And most of us are so greatly impacted by this because we're ignorant. We are ignorant to the schemes. We don't even understand that Satan is the God of this world. Yes, we've been given authority over it. But there is a level of authority that him and his demons have. As I stated in the beginning of the sermon, we are talking about the function of fasting. Why do we fast? Why do we pray? And we're not fasting for God to do something. We are fasting to hear God. We are fasting to get clarity, to die to this flesh, to crucify this flesh so that I can hear from heaven what has been holding me up, what has been getting in the way of my breakthrough. And Ephesians 1 lets me know that we're not fasting, fasting for answers to change God's mind because Ephesians 1 says that God has already given us everything that we need to live victorious. Ephesians 1 says, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace 
that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be into effect when the time when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Everything that I said is past tense. He already gave it to us. He has already given us authority. He has already given us power. He has already given us dominion. So we are not fasting for God to give us something. We are fasting to hear the strategies of heaven. For God to reveal what has been oppressing us, that there is no way in our human knowledge and understanding that we would have access to even know. He has already blessed us. So if my life is not reflective of it, It means I'm not working this word. It means I haven't taken dominion over the issues of my life. I have no idea what God has given me authority over. It is not that this word isn't true. It's not that this word isn't a lie. I am ignorant to what I have been given access to. When it comes to spiritual warfare, Paul told us that we are the determining factor in whether the devil can operate in our lives or not. He said, give no place to the devil, or the Amplified Version says, leave no room or foothold for the devil, give no opportunity for, to him. Why would Paul say this if everything was done once we confessed Jesus? Why would Paul be telling us to give no place to the enemy? He was talking to Christians. Ephesians 4 and 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Why is Paul telling Christians not to steal? If, we're, if, if it's done, if our ability to be impacted by Satan and his demons, why, why is Paul telling don't steal? But we must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. If we are made righteous through Christ Jesus, what what is Paul talking about? Why Why would he be leaving these kinds of instructions to Christians? Because the righteousness that we receive through Christ Jesus, speaks to our position before God. Before we see Christ, before we say he is Savior, that he has paid the price for my sins, we cannot go before God. We are enemies of God until we've received Jesus. So Christ gives us access. But it does not change that Satan, the god of this world, still desires to kill, steal, and destroy. It does not change his position. It does not change his attempts. It does not change the attacks. We we love to quote, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It still forms. It still comes against. It still may cause trial. It will cause tribulation. It will cause moments of defeat. The word of God says it just won't prosper. 
We have to understand that we are still in an active war. And unless we have the full revelation and knowledge of God and who he is and Jesus and who he is and the Holy Spirit and who he is, we will live defeated. We have to examine the doors, the open doors in our lives that we've give, given access to Satan, legal access to Satan. There are three areas that you should be exploring with God. Lineage, emotional crisis or trauma, and ignorance. God, what's on my bloodline? God, what has happened to me? that has wounded me and hurt me and left me open? And God, what am I ignorant of? These are the questions that we should be asking. I need you to understand that this is not a sermon to get you to go looking for demons under every issue of your life. We have been given victory over all of this through Christ Jesus. But many of us are unaware. And we have no idea what is God's part and what is our part. Romans 13 says, and I want, and I highlighted, I don't know if you can see it well, but I highlighted the things that are our responsibility. We do not serve a God who enables us. He will not do your part. He's done what you could not do. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. If you are living defeated, I can guarantee you, you're not doing your part. You think I'm showing up and I'm, I'm, I'm showing up and I confess Jesus. That is the bare minimum. What has God given you? What is on your bloodline? What have you come into relationship with? You see, we open ourselves up and we date and we, we do whatever we want to do. And then we're so confused by what comes with a person. They have a bloodline too. The friendships that you open yourselves up to, they have a bloodline too. Why, when I get around this person, I start feeling this way? Why, when I, when I spend too much time, I find myself doing this or doing that? You're, you're unaware of the spiritual forces that are impacting you. And God is not going to do your part. Some of us say we, 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 we live as if we want God to just drag us out of every sinful thing. Well, that would be taking away our free will. I was having a conversation with a friend, and she was sharing all these health issues that she's been having. And as I'm listening, I, I, I know, I've known this person long enough to to know some family history. And as they're talking, I just looked at them and I said, do you realize you're not even living your life? You're living your family's history. 
you're living every sickness and disease that, that, that has been on your bloodline. Everything that you've just said, I can tell you another family member or two or three who've gone through the same exact stuff. But we say bloodline doesn't matter. We say curses that impact generations. No, that's not relevant to today. And we say this when the preacher says it. But when the doctor asks you to fill out your medical history, when you go for your checkup and they say, does anybody in your family have this? We, we fill it out with no problem. Oh, yeah, we want them to know everything because I need you to catch everything early. I, I need early detection. But we come into the house of the Lord, and we're like, that's not relevant. What's, what's in my family history is not relevant to my spiritual status. It doesn't impact the victory that I walk in. No, no one needs to know what the sins of my family. No one needs to know the secrets running rampant in my family because that doesn't impact me. I'm an individual. And, and that's a very American self-centered stance that we take. That this is my life. I'm independent. I'm an individual. I'm not impacted. We don't call God the ancient of days. For no reason. He knows the past, the present, and the future. There are ancient demonic spirits that operate in your individuality. Your self-centeredness stands no chance against a spirit that's been in operation for centuries. Your rejection of the truth does not make it less true. Your unwillingness to do your digging and understanding your history and what is on your bloodline does not make its impacts on your life any less true. It makes you ignorant. And like I said, we respect it when the doctor says it to us. We'll get on the phone. Mom, what did Granny have? Was it heart disease? No, di didn't, didn't this person have an issue with that? No, we want the doctors to know. But you stand in pride in the presence of God. That, that history doesn't matter. It doesn't impact me. My decisions, my sinful living isn't going to impact my children. I can do what I want to do as long as they got, as long as I leave them some money, some opportunity, they're going to be good. Leave them money. And, and what happens when they lose their mind? Leave them possessions. And what happens when sickness? Hits your front door. Our arrogance, our unwillingness to submit to the realities of the word of God does not make us any stronger, any smarter. It makes us powerless. And we live lives full of oppression. I'm closing because Satan doesn't care about our ignorance. He doesn't care about what we don't know. He, he doesn't play fair. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the power and the authority that we have been given through Christ Jesus. If Pastor Keenan and Brittany could just be ready to pray, if anyone desires to come up for prayer, I'm going to list off some things. Because like I said, 
um, Satan's a master rebrander. He rebrands stuff in a way, and you're like, that's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. And oftentimes, we try to deal with the symptom of something. You know, I'm really anxious. I'm really anxious. And you don't realize the spirit of fear has been wreaking havoc in your bloodline for generations. And so I'm just trying to calm myself. I'm just trying to, okay, I just got to get, I just have to schedule better. I just need to get more organized. And you don't understand. It doesn't matter how many times you get organized. That spirit is going to tear you up until you stand in the power and the authority that we are given through Christ Jesus. And you rebuke that thing. And you decree and you declare the goodness of the Lord over your life. I also want to say that there's no shame. There's no room for pride in the presence of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of what is a part of your story. Walking in your truth may be the key for someone else to walk in theirs. So I always like to tell on myself. My bloodline was full of a lot of stuff. Anger, rage, drug dealing, mental illness. I could keep going. Confession. When you come into the knowledge of something, confession, repentance, that's all our God asks for. So as I list off these things, if you've participated in them, if you've opened yourself up to them, I invite you to come down for prayer. Spirit of divination. That sounds super spiritual, right? Fortune tellers, palm readers, spirit of divination, engaging with witch doctors, zodiac, horoscopes, rebellion, drugs, selling drugs. We say, ooh, I'm not a witch. What you think you cooking? We celebrate that in culture, cooking drugs. What you cooking? What does that do to the person that consumes it? It alters their state of being. It causes them to, to, their families to be destroyed. Lives ruined. It changes their destiny. But you're not a witch. Spirit of jealousy. Being jealous, that doesn't sound like a big deal, right? You want to know what some of the, the, the fruit from the spirit of jealousy? Murder. Revenge. Spite. Anger. Rage. Extreme competition. Envy. Hatred. Or maybe it's a lying spirit. You know, little white lies aren't a big deal. What does the lying spirit look like? Deception. Flattery. Religious bondage. This says you got to behave this way and look this way and be this way. Slander. Gossip. Gossip. That's not a big deal, huh? The root of it is a lying spirit. Superstitions. Innocent superstitions. No big deal. Been doing this since childhood. And you may say, Pastor Z, this stuff's just not that big of a deal. Guess what? Believers are the only one that have problems with authority. The kingdom of darkness 
They don't care how innocent it is. If they have legal right to step in to your world, they will take it. A perverse spirit, a filthy mind, pornography, abortion, child abuse. Again, if you have been impacted by any of these things, please do not let the enemy keep you in your seat. There is freedom in the atmosphere. Twisting the word, sexual perversions, foolishness, chronic worry, spirit of pride, self-deception. You're the only one who don't realize you're ruining your life. That's pride. Self-deception. Scornful, arrogant, a rejection of God, idleness. I got all the time in the world. I can do what I want to do. That's pride. A spirit of heaviness, excessive mourning, self-pity, woe is me all the time, hopelessness, despair, suicidal thoughts, depression, insomnia, rejection. Everywhere you go, you just feel rejected. And it's everybody else all the time, a spirit of whoredom unfaithfulness, adultery, love of money, idolatry, fornication, worldliness, excessive appetites. We don't talk about that a lot in church. Overeating, overindulgence, it's sin. Chronic dissatisfaction. No matter how much you have, no matter how much God blesses you, no matter how much you receive, you are just never satisfied. You're still always looking for what's next. That's a spirit. Spirit of infirmity, weakness, cancer, arthritis, lingering disorders, things nobody can put their finger on. It's just sickness. Spirit of bondage, fear, Fear is not an emotion, it's a spirit. Compulsive sin, you just can't help yourself. Bondage to sin and addictions. Phobias, spirit of fear, phobias, nightmares, terrors, fear of man, fear of death, heart attacks, torment, horror. These are things from Satan. God never intended us to experience these things. The spirit of Antichrist denies the deity of Christ. Christ is just a teacher. Jesus is cool, but denies the atonement. Humanism, deception, lawlessness, spirit of error, false doctrines. You're unteachable. You see, when somebody says a spirit of error, you're like, that's not me. But can anybody teach you anything? Or do you know it all, all the time? That's a spirit of error. You see how Satan rebrands himself and make it seem like it's, it's not a big, oh, she's just unteachable. No, it's a spirit of error. Defensiveness, argumentative, unsubmissive. Most of this new age movement that says I can do all the things and still worship Jesus, that's a spirit of error. And it is a direct contradiction to the word of God. This is why we fast and pray. Because these things impact us before we even have the knowledge. I always like to say for any parents, you know that you don't have to teach your children how to rebel. You have to teach them to submit. You have to teach them to be obedient. Before they can even walk, no. 
and they're pushing away. I got it. I can do it myself. You have to teach them to receive. You have to teach them to be obedient. You have to guide them. You have to teach them in the way that they should go. We are no different before our Father. I know that we like to think we are good on our own. But our goodness is nothing without the revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. God, we thank you for your word. God, I just pray that it landed on good soil. God, your word says that it will not return void. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to continue to minister to your people today. to have your way in us and through us for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen.